intro to Power Automate desktop flows, and then I also throw in that they are also known as RPA. Um, in case you ever need help Googling anything, uh, that's the history behind that. So um, when all else fails, look up the other name. And OK, so I wanted to start this conversation talking about Power Automate and kind of like level setting with everybody. So there's two types of workflows that we're kind of going to be talking today. There are cloud flows and then there are desktop flows. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Cloud flows run in the cloud and desktop flows run on the desktop. There's some differences here and there, like cloud cloud flows have access to different connectors that Microsoft has created. You can extend those capabilities um, by creating custom connectors to your own applications or what have you. Um, and really, they don't really require human intervention uh, anywhere really, except maybe outside of the trigger. Um, Whereas desktop flows, they're a little bit different. So they uh, they can actually connect to apps that don't have any way to connect to them. So these are apps that are super old, maybe, or you know, they just don't have public APIs, or perhaps they are some super niche subject and it's kind of like an older system. Um, and so desktop flows really they kind of use like recorded steps and images and UI elements and different things like that um, to navigate those different situations that we might find ourselves in. Um, one cool thing to note is that they can be run on a physical desktop. So this could be like a laptop in your office just hidden in like a broom closet or it could be a virtual desktop so you could have multiple running um, so on and so forth. And then there are two types of modes for these uh, desktop flows. Uh, one is attended mode, which is essentially I would sit at my computer and I could trigger the workflow and I watch all the steps kind of play out and I sit here and intervene where I need to. Um, maybe it needs me to authenticate some credentials. Maybe it needs me to input something. Um, and then there is unattended mode, which basically does not, it runs by itself as long as it's logged in and, and has access to, to, you know, the desktop. So uh, you can kind of let it do its own thing. Uh, so without further, those are kind of the two. And then, so I see a lot of people compare them, but one thing I wanted to touch on is that they are, uh, since, you know, this is Power Platform and it's the, uh, benefit of having everything in one platform is that they work together and they're better together. So you can actually start your workflows and trigger them into the cloud based off of data. You could pass that data into a desktop flow and you can just check back and forth. And really this line here, right here, the dotted line is representing a gateway, um, which is ex kind of like exactly what it sounds like. It's kind of the middleman that determines who's allowed to pass to this desktop and who's not. Um, and so really what we see here is we can just keep chucking data back and forth so that we can use the right type of flow when we need to. Um, you'll hear some people say that desktop flows are a little bit unreliable. In some cases that may be true, so you might wanna use a cloud flow. Um, because if you know you have a legacy system and they update their interface, now you have to update the desktop flow. Um, so it's important to kind of keep track of those things. Um, so use Cloudflow where you can and then just kind of pass that information back and forth. Um, check it over the gateway to each other so that they can work in unison. Um, and so really you just see that keep happening and you can stop it uh, whenever you would like really. Um, and then I wanted to include a slide about why don't companies just put everything in the cloud? Because um, this is a question that I had when I first started, uh, really just in tech in general, is why doesn't everything just go in the cloud? I don't, I don't understand. Um, well, it turns out there's a lot of reasons why, but there's kind of a main top three is they may have a super long contract they just signed. Maybe they have like a three year contract with this system and now they're stuck with it and maybe they want to move. But right now this is their their this is their reality. They are using the system. Um, another case is they might have a bunch of data in this system. Um, it could be some super niche thing, uh, but they could have like decades of data and I've seen things like that. And, you know, they'll have to plan a full migration plan. Maybe they want to move to the cloud, but they just don't have the resources or the budget or it's not a priority just yet. Um, so it's kind of important to to note that that it's not as simple as like a lift and shift. Anyone who has done SharePoint migrations 
uh, probably knows <laughs> what I mean by that. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes there, there are legacy systems that are out there. Like I know for logistics, there's super old legacy systems and they fulfill all of the needs and they don't need really that much difference. And all of the new systems that are out there may not cover 90% of it. And so maybe that last 10%, that's where, uh, you know, desktop flows could come in and kind of assist there. That way they don't have to do a whole, uh, you know, migration plan or anything like that, or sign new contracts and lose the finances there. Um, so yeah, it's just something to note if you are ever frustrated uh, why everything's not in the cloud and a little bit easier to get to. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, have a little have a little empathy for uh, the companies. Um, so this slide is things that make me think I need a desktop flow. Uh, common use cases are really uh, manual data entry from like a desktop or a web app into a cloud application. Um, any systems, there are a bunch of legacy systems that will only give you data through CSVs, which is essentially Excel. Um, and then you have to download it and upload it and do all of that and it's manual and it takes up times and resources and it's really tedious. Um, uh, and then, of course, that third option, super tedious actions. I know I don't want to do a bunch of things that I have to do, so if I can automate it, why not? Um, whether that's cloud or desktop, but desktop really, again, things that I can't access any other way. Um, so some other things, system criteria, what I look at is there's, you know, because I want to use the right tool, right? Um, I want to only use desktop flows when it's really required, so there should be no other way to get that data through connectors or custom connectors. Um, API and like learning custom connectors is a little bit of a skill up, but it's probably a better way because that data schema is more likely to stay the same um, than the interface perhaps. So it's something to consider. Uh, and also that system should only be accessible through the web or desktop app. Like I have a to-do app that I use called TickTick and um, and it's only accessible through the web or desktop. It doesn't integrate with, say, Outlook. And I'm super into like time blocking and all of that jazz. So um, that's where I would maybe want to like pull in uh, RPA to kind of like shift some things and you know use Flow to block my calendar and different things like that. Um, and then the other one is really it doesn't like for certain use cases, it doesn't fit any other area of the platform. Sometimes it makes sense to make an app. Sometimes it makes sense to just do a cloud flow. Um, when all else fails, I kind of revert to desktop flow. Think of it kind of like it's like a card in your back pocket that if you need to pull it out, you have it. Um, and then you can use it. Uh, and then there is a quote down here at the bottom, which is just because you know how to use a hammer doesn't make everything a nail. So really consider which product is uh, the best product for your use case. Um, and think about that because I know I am a Canvas app first person. I love it. It's fun for me. I want to do it all the time. Um, but that does not mean everything should be answered with an app. Um, so something to consider too. And then demo time. OK, so this use case is essentially a personal problem that I have. Uh, SR is very aware on the call. He's my coworker, and I have a bad habit of getting in the zone and forgetting to log off for the day and record my hours because I'm doing a bunch of crazy stuff. And then look at the time now it's 6 a.m. Um, so I want Power Automate to disrupt my workflow and kind of like force me to get out of the zone and then ask me to record my hours for the day because I'm not doing that as I should be. Um, so I am not a brave soul. I'm not going to live demo it. So I recorded it and I'll just narrate it as we go through. It is going to go pretty fast. Got 12 minutes here. So uh, so yeah, we're going to go through it. <laughs> so first we are building the workflow. We're calling it quit in time because it is time for me to quit and get off of the computer. Uh, so we'll go ahead and create that. On the left hand side, you will see actions, which is exactly like cloud flows. You just pull them over and you need as you need them. Uh, right hand side, you see variables, input and output. Let me pause here just for clarity. Uh, input and output variables are a little bit different in the sense that they uh, pass things in and out of the desktop flow. So that cloud integration we were talking about, cloud flows, that would be an input and output variable. That's how you're tossing things back and forth. Um, flow variables are just variables that are created throughout the process of your workflows and your subflows and different things like that. Um, you'll see that a little bit later on. 
Um, but I did want to clarify that. And then we have UI elements, where, which are basically elements on the application, images that may be related to that. Um, perhaps we use the recorder and it's capturing images so it remembers what things look like. Um, subflows, it is essentially, uh, let me pause here. Subflows are essentially, if you come from a programming background, it's basically like breaking things up. You have your main that runs everything and then your you know, functions can separate everything into different little components. Um, if you come from Power Apps, you may be familiar with component libraries, which are kind of reusable pieces of, uh, of things that you can use in Power Apps. Um, so really subflows are kind of like a neat and tidy way to package little things. Uh, so they are super reusable throughout the process. Um, so you'll see me create one of those here. Um, so first thing I wanted to do here is what I like to do when I'm creating something is I want a roadmap of all of my goals. So I'm going to start here with the comments. We said that we wanted uh, to track our hours. So we want to get the hours. I'm going to have to manually input that here. Um, so we will watch that and then after that, uh, I wanted to disrupt, yeah, remove the distractions is what I called it, um, where basically I need everything on my browser minimized. Everything should be minimized, otherwise I will not look at what I'm supposed to be looking at. Um, and then from there, we are going to track the hours. That's where we're gonna call our subflow later on. And then the last step you'll see here is, uh, basically get me out the door, kick me off the computer. I uh, really kind of make it more of an effort to stay on the computer than it is to stay off of it. Um, so we'll start there. And then from here, you'll start to see that we are going to use a, uh, we're going to use a dialogue box. Um, some of you may be familiar with this from older days. Uh, I did a little bit of it in college. Um, one thing to note here, because uh, this took me a minute to figure out is dialog boxes for whatever reason, if you're using Power Automate desktop um, and you have multiple screens, you have to disconnect from your other screens. Otherwise, they won't pop up. I don't know why, but that seems to be an ongoing issue. So you may have to constantly disconnect or reconnect um, if you are on a physical uh, laptop or doing it, you know, by yourself. Um, so from here, I'm just going to input the title of the message box and then some dialogue, which is just the body of the message box, asking me how many hours did I work today? I'm not going to put a default value. It uh, doesn't have an input type for numerics, so we left that alone. And then keep it on the top. You'll also see that variables get produced here, user input, button pressed, um, which is basically what did they select? Um, what did they put in? If I put in eight hours, seven hours, and I rename the variable so it's a little bit more clear. Uh, in our case, we're not really using button press, so I disable it. Um, that way we can just, uh, I might re-enable it. There we go, I disabled it. <laughs> um, that way you're not having extra variables because once they start to stack up, you might get lost in the sauce and have a bajillion. Um, so avoid creating any extra variables if you don't need them. Um, from here, I don't want to manually type in the date, so I want uh, Power Automate Desktop to get the current date and time for me. Um, it's too many clicks to select a date picker for me. So I'll select current date only. You'll see the variables, and I'll just rename it to date without the time. And then you'll see that go in there. Um, I just want to make sure we're good on time or should I fast forward through some of this? Oh, you're good on time. Take your time. We have, okay, we have another cool. hour left. So. All right. So remove distractions. Very simple. Just show the desktop. The workstation is pretty good with anything like that. Uh, screen resolution, screenshots. Um, we'll use uh, play sound later on. Um, so we will just remove the distractions, get rid of everything except for what I need to be looking at, and let's create our workflow to actually track the hours. Um, you know, timesheets are due at the end of the week. I don't want to make uh, Power Automate Desktop go to our timesheet URL every single day. I want to track it in an Excel sheet, just kind of a per personal preference in this case, um, although you could make 
uh, you could enhance this so that it does uh, go into a URL and actually type everything out for you. Um, I just didn't do that here for the sake of time. Um, so now we are in a subflow and you can tell by the two tabs up top, main and sub and the subflow uh, save timesheet data. And you'll see that I'm going to use Excel. Excel is really a super common use case for uh, desktop flows. So if you are venturing out, I would get familiar with it um, because it's pretty useful. Sometimes you uh, need CSVs or Excel files to be kind of like the middleman between the two data systems. Um, so it's pretty useful in this case. So from here, we are opening Excel. We want to populate a date column. We want to populate the hours column, and then uh, we want to close the Excel sheet. So once that's done, um, so we will pull that over. And then I'm just showing the Excel sheet here, one column for date, one column for hours, pretty simple table going on there um, that aligns with our actions. Cool, and I'll check that over to the side. And then from here, and really, I would suggest to everybody go through these actions, read them all at least once or twice. And then once you're more familiar, you should be able to start searching. Um, the search seems to be from beginning to end, uh, like a starts with search. So um, do get familiar with those names. It'll save you a lot of trouble um, trying to work your way around something that might already exist. Um, so that would be my recommendation. So we just launched the Excel sheet and then we are going to get a column name in this case. So it's column one and column two uh, for the date and for the uh, hours. So you'll just see me rename this one column name and then I choose one. And then from there, we need to get the first empty row from that column so that we can start inputting data. Um, this one's under advanced, and so you'll just see me scroll and find it. First free row. And we'll set that up. And notice that we're using our variables. So here we're saying, what column are we going to look at? And I'm selecting the variable picker, and you can see that I'm picking column name one since we defined that in the step above. Um, and then we have our first free row column. And since I used the number one for the first one, I use the same in the second one so that that's uh, clear that they're related. Um, and then we are going to write to the Excel sheet. So all of the variables you see on that right hand side, we can input those here as well. So we're going to do our write mode where what we're going to write. We want the current date and you'll notice that these variables open up. They have those little arrows. Um, if you open the carrot, you have different options. Um, like for current date, you could get the year or the month or the day. But in our case, we don't need that. Um, and you'll see I specify the column in the row. Uh, and then we hit save. So from here, um, we can kind of simplify our lives a little bit. We can click on all of these. We can copy them. We can paste them. And it's actually very handy um, because we are essentially doing the same steps for that uh, hours column. Um, and then we can just drag and drop it where we need, which is pretty nice to have. Um, so it's pretty easy to rearrange things as you need. And then I'll just rename these columns so that they are targeting that second column instead of the first column. And we'll just skip that a second. And then we have the right to Excel. Yep, we want to remove the write the date and we want the hours worked. And you can use the variable click the variable picker here or you can type it out if you feel confident on your typing skills. Um, I can sometimes have typing issues, so I prefer to use the variable picker. Um, obviously, the more that you're in here, the more used to it you'll be and you'll be probably quicker typing it out. 
And then we'll just close the Excel sheet here. And then we want to save it. So we have that option. So we want to save the document before closing Excel. That way we're actually tracking everything and we save all the work that we've just done. And then if we pop back over to main, so it's very much like programming where you have one main and you need to call these subflows or the other functions to actually use them. Um, so from here, we actually need to run our subflow. Otherwise, it'll never run and we'll never get anything tracked. So you can see here we have run subflow and we'll pull that over. And notice that I'm pulling them all over to where we have our comments. Um, just to make our lives well organized. Um, yep, and then so that should run the save timesheet data subflow. And then the last step is to push me out the door. Um, and so there's a few different things that we can do here. So I added in a bunch just to kind of show the different options that we have. We have a play sound, which I can play here. I'm going to play a customized sound. Um, you can use the system sounds or you can upload your own WAV file or, you know, link to it in the file picker, which is what I did. And then we have other options. We can lock the computer. We can, um, yeah, we can lock it. We can log off. We can shut down. We can do all of it. Um, I also use my, this is my personal computer, so I'm just going to lock it. But you can see that all of these are here. Lock workstation is pretty straightforward. Um, for log off and shut down, you do have these options for the both of them. You'll see the pop up. You have the option to force it. Um, so if you have files open and you want to actually save them, I would suggest not forcing it. <laughs> But if you really need that that really hard stern push out the door, um, feel free and sync to the cloud when all else fails. Um, of course, we want to run this flow at the end of this demo um, so we can make sure that things actually work. So I am going to disable these two steps at the bottom. So I'm actually going to disable the three steps at the bottom so that I don't get locked out and have to sign back in and do all of that. Um, but that's just kind of an example of what you can do. And then we are going to disable those. And then, of course, we are going to want to test this flow. Um, one thing I will say is if this was not a demo and I was doing this in real life, I would have, you know, coded a little, tested a little, and I would have kept doing that back and forth. Um, because you want to make sure each step is working before you move forward. Um, and really, that'll that'll save you a lot of headache. That way you get things sorted progressively. Um, OK, so you see here I hit the play button and then the dialog box pops up and asks me hours worked. How many hours did you work today? And I'm going to input eight here. So we'll hit OK. And then we'll wait. We see Excel pop up. Type in those things. And I don't know if everybody heard the sound, but it said goodbye. And so I know that the workflow finished, but I want to double check to make sure that that timesheet has those values in it because um, sometimes it does go pretty quickly and we see that it's in there. So all of our work was worth it because now we have a way to kick me off the computer when I need to. Um, and that is it for that demo. And that is all I have. So thank you. I also found out how to use stickers today on uh, presentations, so that was really cool and I like them. Thank you whoever at Microsoft did that because it's really fun and exciting and we need more um, so I can be obnoxious with other <laughs> presentations. So we do have a question from Cameron. Oh, yes. So Cameron, if you turn on your mic, you should be able to ask. Yeah, sure. Hey, hey Michelle, great job. Uh, I'm on the uh, the Dataverse team actually with Sean. I'm a Microsoft person, so really cool to see how you're using our products. Love, love the ingenuity. Just a question, maybe I didn't catch at the beginning. Was that a full version of Power Automate Desktop, or is that the version now that's kind of built in free into Windows? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. It it was on this computer when I bought it already. Um, okay. But I do have a uh, developer tenant, so I use that to sign in and do everything. OK, OK, cool. Just yeah. I mean, that was a simple use case, but it was it's cool to see what you can automate and uh, what how easy it is to be hands on. So thanks for showing that.
Awesome. Yeah, I thought that was a great use case myself, especially in the consulting world where, you know, you build time to accurately uh, charge clients. That's a, it's a really good use of the tools to do that. Yeah, thank you. I honestly, I would take it a step further. Um, I would love to have it triggered by Cloudflow at like 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. every day, depending on, on the day. Um, and then ask me, am I ready to log off? And so I can be like, yes, and kind of be that constant nudge. I would love for it to really nag me um, until I get fed up and actually log out. <laughs> that was but, a pretty cool demo, and I'm I'm definitely guilty of, you know, uh, wanting to be efficient with time tracking, but then not really getting it done because you just get carried away with the day and then all the tasks that you've got to do. So this was really cool to see how you can utilize the tool sets and, and and it comes with a couple of features that are already available out of the box for you right all you had to do was get the inputs configured and then also the flow to get your you and the route of excel and like you said you could totally incorporate it with your time entry system if, if possible and it could go through the whole process by itself yeah definitely yeah, I just didn't want to put the time sheet, my company's timesheet up on a presentation. To be no, honest. yeah, totally. But yeah. And I think we do have another question. Uh, Chris oh, yeah. has his hand up. Yeah, great demo, Michelle. Um, in regards to the cloud flow, uh, has anyone heard if Microsoft plans to add to the cloud flows the ability to enable and disable an action like, like Michelle did during the demo on the desktop version? I think for now, I guess the only option is to either create a scope or to have a condition set it set it in a way that it can not be met. So I usually do it like you know one equal to two, and then I'll drop in an action to disable it. Um, I know that's one of the most commonly asked um, features. Um, so hopefully it's on the roadmap, and we'll see it pretty soon. Okay, thank you. I also like the. Uh ingenuity there to record your demo like that and then narrate it. I thought that was uh, anybody who's done a lot of demoing that that made a lot of sense to do. So uh, kudos to uh, doing that beforehand. Thank you. This is my first time presenting anywhere. So I was very, very nervous about doing the demo live. So I was like, let me <laughs> record it. I'll narrate it live and then it won't be as much pressure, which thank God I did because the recording was originally like, 40 minutes and so I cut it down um little bits and bops here um so saved us a little bit of time yeah it was awesome yeah. you did awesome yeah thank you thank for you. putting it all together and making the experience so good for us because obviously the attendees watching it kind of the flow just goes goes in together so well <laughs>